Okay, here we go. Hello everyone and welcome to Loop and Learn, the T1D speaker series. And today it's real exciting. We get to hear all about Tidepool with Brandon Arbiter, Vice President, Product and Business Development. As we always do, we're going to do our little disclaimer, which is the Loop app is a do-it-yourself closed loop algorithm. While it may seem obvious, please consult with your healthcare professional regarding your diabetes management. Please remember that this project is highly experimental and not FDA approved for therapy. Therefore, you take full responsibility for building and running the system and do so at your own risk. And as a reminder, we have the new website called loopandlearn.org. Uh, mark it down, bookmark it. It's a great place to go for information on how to start doing loops, important announcements about iOS updates and speaker events, hot tips and topics, uh, news releases, and basically anything that's important to those of us learning and living with the DIY loop. I want to go on now and introduce you to Brandon Alberter, VP of Product and Business Development for Tidepool. His work includes relationship building with partners such as device makers, researchers, app developers, nonprofits, and clinics, as well as designing prioritization frameworks to direct Tidepool's design and development work, and he'll tell you all about that. His motivation in bringing Tidepool Loop to the mainstream is making this incredible community design solution broadly accessible. Tidepool is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded by people with diabetes, caregivers, and leading healthcare providers committed to helping all people with insulin requiring diabetes. That's all of us. He's a graduate of the Engineering Management Systems, Industrial Engineering and Operations Research, Economics, Earth and Environmental Engineering at Columbia University in New York. He honed his skills in the food industry. What better place for a person with type one diabetes for fresh, direct, and it's a great story to hear about. He's had type one diabetes since 2011, and he also serves on the board of JDRF San Francisco. And in the past three years, he's also become a husband and a new dad. I hope you really enjoy this talk. He has so much to share with us. Uh, I'll turn this over to you now. Welcome, Brandon. Thank you for being here. Joanne, thank you very much for that wonderful introduction. Wow, you did your research. That was amazing. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Brandon Arbeiter. Um, I am the Vice President of Product and Business Development at Tidepool. I, uh, in my personal life, as a person living with diabetes, I am a DIY looper. And today I want to tell you a bit about my story and an update on Tidepool and what we've been working on and what we're working on next. So the format for today, Joanne, if it's okay with you, um, I've got some slides that I'll run through to kind of talk through uh, the story and then I'll open it up for Q&A. I see some other tide coolers here. Awesome, thank you. I feel so loved and supported. That's amazing. I see I see my wife is on too. Um, so without further ado, I'm gonna start my screen share. All right, so this is me. Uh, this is a comic strip that I never imagined would happen. So I was actually diagnosed a little later in life than most people. I was diagnosed with type one diabetes at age 27 while I was living in New York. And I was actually initially diagnosed with type two diabetes by my primary care physician. I was put on traditional type two meds for about six months. Uh, I was losing a ton of weight and uh, very, very uncomfortable. Grew an, you know, what to call it other than a fear of food as I was checking my blood sugars and none of these meds were working finally six months later, I got the appropriate diagnosis and started getting some insulin and then started to look quite a bit healthier. Uh, NPR did a story about me, uh, which is unexpected and amazing. And it turned into a comic strip that you can find on WNYC.org. In my own personal diabetes management, I use Loop. Typically at this part of the presentation, I explain what Loop is, but I understand that that is not something that I have to do today. 
I'll just say, as you all probably feel, it has been life changing. I have been playing around with different DIY technologies for my diabetes probably since, well, God, since my diagnosis. This was something that I did in the very early days of Night Scout. Um, I, and if you go to, if you put in your Night Scout and then go to slash clock.html, it probably still works. This was a feature that I was very involved in, in my, uh, back in 2014, which just makes your whole tablet show your blood glucose. And I had these up all over my house and that was pretty cool. Then I connected it to my Hue light bulbs and got my light bulbs changing colors. Now, at this point, I was, God, I don't know, 29 years old. And I was living in San Francisco. And I had a girlfriend. And I thought, well, gosh, rather than like teach her about all the different numbers, I'll just say, hey, if it's the middle of the night, and this light turns on and turns red, make sure I'm awake. And we did that for a few days. And then she said, Brandon, I don't like these lights. I like the numbers. I want to see your numbers. Please put the lights away put the numbers back on the wall. So then I did what any reasonable man would do and I married her and she is my wife watching upstairs. This was one of my favorite uh, DIY Night Scout integrations. So it had kind of all the information that I needed being someone living in San Francisco at the time. It had my Night Scout readings, my blood glucose, it had the weather today and it had the buses and trains that would go by my apartment and how many minutes until the next one arrived. So. I was just there, I knew when I left what my blood sugar was and whether or not I needed an umbrella. And um, you know, during my day job, I'm working at Tidepool and we had a data science team, have a data science team. And one of my data scientists said, hey, Brandon, you've been tinkering with these different technologies for quite a while. Do you wanna see the impact that it's had on your time and range? And I said, whoa, sure, that'd be awesome. And he made this chart for me. This was a rolling one year average of every day over two years of what my time and range was. And you could see that I went from about 75% time in range to about 85% time in range from uh, basically the beginning of 2015 through, uh, through June. Now, a lot was going on in this community uh, at the time. This was, I think this is the very beginning. This was in 20, October, 2013. This was the first diabetes mine D data exchange, which is where a group of, I'll just say it, a group of hackers came together to talk about what we were doing in our diabetes technology. And here you see uh, Dr. Nate Heinzman uh, speaking. And over here is Lane Desborough, uh, famously one of the founders of Night Scout. Here's John Caustic. Uh, many of you might heard might have heard of John. He uh, he was, I think, the first person to figure out how to get the data off of your Dexcom back in 2013 and into the cloud. And here's Howard Look, my uh, uh, founder at Tidepool uh, and Sarah Krugman, our first designer at Tidepool. And over the course of the day, we wrote down various themes and I wanna call your attention to one theme that came out of this day. And here it is written down for the first time in the diabetes community history. We are not waiting. This is something that Lane Desborough said during his speech. Howard Look wrote it down, put it on the whiteboard at the end of the day. And then uh, Lane Desborough bought a domain and a hashtag was born and a movement was born. And uh, it's pretty exciting to be part of that. So again, this is back in 2013. That was literally when we founded Tidepool. So we, uh, I moved from New York to the Bay Area in September, that D-Data exchange was in October, we got Tidepool up and running. And what is Tidepool? It is a platform for interoperability in diabetes devices. We are a nonprofit organization. We have a web app uh, at app.tidepool.org. We have a mobile app for iOS and Android. And now we're working on Tidepool Loop. Talk more about that in a few minutes. The web app was the first piece of software that you could use to take data from different insulin pumps and different CGMs, different glucose meters and put them together at the same time. So specifically back in 2013, I had a Medtronic insulin pump. I had a Dexcom CGM and there was no software in the world where I could see that data come together in one place at one time. That was why we built Tidepool. 
we were compatible with a lot of devices. We are compatible with a lot of devices, Dexcom, Abbott, Medtronic, Insulet, Tandem, yada, yada, yada. The list has grown and grown and grown. So uh, I recommend if you're interested in any particular device, just go to tidepool.org slash devices and you can see if, uh, if any particular device is compatible. I wanted to mention a few new features that we've added in the, in the last few months, um, things that I'm particularly excited about. One is the ability to export my data to Excel. So any of you with a Tidepool account, and if you're using Loop, you can connect your data to Apple Health and you connect Apple Health to Tidepool to get all of your data into Tidepool. Uh, then you can export your data to Excel. So this is something that I'm super excited about. Log into your Tidepool account, click on your name, scroll to the bottom and go ahead, you can choose any date range and hit export. Uh, I'm gonna, uh, this is the only one with this yellow line. So uh, another feature that we've just rolled out is um, configurable date ranges, both for the basics view, as well as uh, print, uh, as well as the PDF printout. This is something that was requested a lot out of clinics. So if you're a clinician tuning in, uh, this feature is now there and we will be rolling out configurable dates to more parts of the interface soon. I'm gonna go ahead and hit play so we can get rid of this line. Uh, Joanne, if you can't see my slides anymore because I just full screened it, let me know. Otherwise, uh, I'll perfect. just keep going. It's okay, perfect. great. So uh, another feature that we rolled out recently was the ability to filter devices. Now, for those of us using HealthKit and De Dexcom Clarity and lots of other things, data is coming in from lots of different places. And you might want to look at your time and range for a very specific uh, data source. So now... If you look at the trends view, for instance, on Tidepool Web, go down to the bottom right and you can choose to filter for uh, specific devices. What is next for Tidepool Web? So we've got a few things that are coming up. Right now we're working on enhanced administration for Tidepool uh, for clinics. We're also working on, and this is very exciting, the Tidepool Loop prescription portal. We are going to be working soon on visualization updates for automated insulin dosing. So that's closed loop systems. Again, when we started Tidepool, this was a world without closed loop systems. So this was sensor augmented pumps, meaning there's a pump, there's a CGM, there's a blood glucose meter, and you want to see that together. There's a whole new way of visualizing data that can be optimized for these new closed loop or automated insulin dosing systems. So we'll be working on that soon. And we'll also be working on real time data coming into Tidepool loop and being shown. So that's what's next. Tidepool has always been free for people with diabetes and their clinicians. That's something that we take a lot of pride in. Um, Making sure that folks have access to their data, uh, we think is critical. So as a nonprofit, that is something that we've been able to do and we're really happy about that. One thing that was personally a dream of mine, and I know a lot of other people in the Tidepool team felt the same way, was uh, enabling the community to donate data to research. So now for anyone who signs up for a new Tidepool account, we ask, would you like to donate your anonymized diabetes data to support research? We have had, I think over 20,000 donations of data so far, and some incredible insights have come out of it, both at Tidepool, uh, in universities, in industry. So here's something that really blows my mind. Um, this is an, an, an analysis of Tidepoolers using CGM and their percent time below 54 milligrams per deciliter. Looking at my age demographic in particular, so I'm 36, this group of folks between the ages of 30 and 39 are spending on average 24 minutes a day below 54. These are people on CGMs. This blew my mind. And um, you know, I'll never forget, I, uh, I've, I've shown this data in presentations before and uh, a friend of mine named Dan, who's who's seen me present a couple of times, stood up and raised his hand and said, Brandon, I just want to share with you that when I saw you present this data for the first time, it brought tears to my eyes because I always thought it was just me. I had no idea that this is what the whole community was going through. And that resonated with me so deeply because I also thought this was just me. And seeing this data made me feel that way too. 
And if you go to Tidepool's blog, tidepool.org slash blog, you can see a bunch of data science blogs that show different slices of data in the big data donation project um, and see how this data might resonate with you. Um, I imagine a lot of folks, by the way, on this call have donated their data to Tidepool so, uh, or to Tidepool's big data donation project. So on behalf of the community, huge, huge, huge thank you. This is uh, me with Howard Look and Katie DeSimone. We are standing in front of the FDA. Uh, Tidepool has made a habit of visiting the FDA a lot. And this has, been, this has been great and very interesting. We've learned a lot of things. For instance, this is an FDA guidance document. And the guidance documents tell companies how they might do things in a way that is uh, compliant with the FDA's regulations. However, interestingly enough, and most companies seem to ignore this or not know this at all, every guidance document has this black box right on the top. And this black box says you can use an alternative approach if the approach satisfies the requirements of the applicable statutes and regulations. If you want to discuss alternative approaches, contact the FDA. So we did that because we read the guidance documents and said, gosh, this doesn't seem like the way modern software companies work. And Tidepool uses tools like Jira. And we use tools like Google Docs. And those tools aren't, don't seem to be contemplated by FDA guidance documents, but we think this is the way to build great software. So as I said, we went to the FDA and said, hey, FDA, this is how we think we wanna do it. Is this okay with you? And the FDA said, yes, this is awesome. This is a great way to do it. Please not just do it, go talk about it. Tell other companies, other startups, how you're doing it uh, and, and spread the word. So we've been doing that. So meanwhile, here we are starting Tidepool. We're talking to the FDA. The community is getting together. The community is gathering. And the We Are Not Waiting movement is really taking off. And Night Scout is at the heart of it. Again, back in 2014, you've got people all over the world now being able to see their CGM data from miles and miles away from the person living with diabetes. Night Scout is taking off. Here's the first 220 days of the Night Scout CGM in the Cloud Facebook group. And here's me. Uh, I was using Night Scout for my own diabetes so I could see my blood glucose on my watch because nothing was more empowering to me than being able to look at my wrist and seeing my blood glucose. And I had never in my life run a half marathon. Never in my life. I didn't dream that that was even possible. And all of a sudden, being able to see my glucose on my watch, I realized I have more data about what's going on inside my body than any other runner in the half marathon. So I signed up for a half marathon and I ran it and I live streamed the data. And I believe that I became on that day, the first person in history to live stream their glucose data during a competitive race. And you can see my glucose trace. I, I had a no hitter for, uh, for my first half marathon. At that time, I was living with this gentleman, and I hope you all know who he is. Uh, if you don't, I'm very happy to tell you. This was my roommate. This is someone who has done more for the diabetes community than maybe anybody else. This is Ben West. Um, and Ben is the person who figured out how to communicate with the Medtronic pump. So one day, I was, uh, I was in, we had a two-bedroom apartment in San Francisco, Ben and me, and Ben started calling me, Brandon, Brandon, get out here. He was in the living room. I was in the bedroom. So I can run out. And what's going on? And he says, put your pump on the table. And I said, okay. <laughs> and I put my pump on the table. And he said, unplug it. Unplug it. Take it off of you. So I like disconnected it from my body. And he said, now watch. Now this all occurred, as you can see on the bottom of my screen here on April 6, 2014. And I peered over at my insulin pump and I watched it. And Ben took his computer and he started typing. And I, I'm staring at this insulin pump and a little circle comes up. And I said, Ben, what did you just do to my insulin pump? And he said, I suspended it. <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, he suspended my insulin pump from his computer. And uh, so I moved out a few months later. 
Um, in all seriousness, this led to something pretty incredible. Uh, and Ben told me, he said on that day, now we have Night Scout and we know how to talk to an insulin pump. We can create an artificial pancreas system. And a few months later, we did. Uh, we had the first open APS. This was, this was it. This was open APS. This was the rig. So back before there was loop, there was APS. You can uh, connect this huge battery on the right to a Raspberry Pi motherboard connected to a Dexcom, to a Carolink stick, to a Medtronic pump. And you could actually run yourself in closed loop. And it was so amazing. I remember asking um, my friend, Chris Hanneman, who was one of the uh, original people using open APS, if he would come speak at the Diabetes Mind D-Data Exchange in 2015. And he said he accepted the invitation and he came and spoke. And at that time, there were five people in the world. There were five people running open APS and watching him speak, my life just changed. Uh, and I get emotional just thinking about it. I, I came home that day and I said to my then girlfriend, who's now my wife, um, I said, her name is Roz. I said, Roz, I have to try to do something and I don't think I'll be able to, but for the next few months, I'm going to spend every weekend trying to get set up on this thing called open APS. I've got to write the code myself. I don't know how to code. So I've got to write the code myself. I'm going to figure it out. Uh, or I'll try, but I'll probably fail, but I need your support because it's going to be really, really hard. And the next weekend I started and by Sunday night, I was up and running and I never looked back. I've been running myself in closed loop bat since 2015. And it's just so, so incredible what this community has come together to do. Meanwhile, the White House learned about Tidepool and Tidepool's efforts through a nonprofit or to, through being a nonprofit organization and working with the FDA uh, to give people access to their data in a big, broad way. And here is Howard Look, our CEO at Tidepool, on stage with Barack Obama right after Tidepool was recognized as a champion of change for precision medicine um, by the White House. And I think this is Dana Lewis of OpenAPS taking a photo of Howard and President Obama with, a, uh, with OpenAPS right in front of her. <clears throat> So as this is happening, the open APS movement is moving forward. And this guy in Minnesota says, well, maybe someday it'll look like this. And there'll be this thing called a Riley link that connects your iPhone to a Medtronic pump. And then in Oakland, California, there's this guy named Nate who built this user interface and says, well, what if what if we could use that Riley link and have this, inter this interface on the iPhone where you can see everything that OpenAPS is doing? And those two things came together and we got Loop. And then Katie D. Simone built Loop Docs to teach people how they can safely uh, get Loop up and running. And again, this community just comes together in the most incredible of ways. Public service announcement, you all know this. If you aren't on Loop and you're thinking about getting started with DIY Loop, don't just dive in. Read all the docs. Read Loop docs. Read Loop and Learn. Understand what it means to use it safely. It is on you. So all that's happening and hundreds or thousands of people are getting up and running on Loop. And being part of the industry, I get to go to these industry conferences and I'm showing all of these like doctors and CEOs like, look, I've got my diabetes all running from my watch and my phone and it's incredible. And the Helmsley Trust uh, sees what's happening and they say, we got to study this. Actually, it was Dr. Jeremy Pettis in San Diego who said to the Helmsley Trust, we've got to figure out what's going on with all of these people who are looping and collect some real clinical data. So then a study got started by the Jabe Center for Health Research. And they started recruiting just as an observational study. They're not telling anyone to use Loop. But if you're already either using Loop or planning to use Loop, you could join this study. And you could see the study started in January of 2019. And then something happened in April where recruitment just started skyrocketing. And over 1,200 people said they wanted to participate. Ultimately, over 800 people were participating. 
I'll give you all five seconds to guess what happened in April of 2019 that caused this surge. Loop started supporting the Omnipod. So what happened in this clinical study? What did they find? Well, they found that, and this is looking at people who uh, started the study and were not using Loop before the study. So they got started. And so the study knew here was glucose before they started looping. Here's glucose after they started looping. Every age group using Loop saw an improvement in time and range. No matter what A1C you had before you started Loop, you saw an improvement in time and range. No matter what your household income is, you saw an improvement in time and range. And no matter what A1C you had entering the study, you saw an improvement in your A1C. The study asked, how well does loop work? How well does it work in the daytime? How well does it work in the nighttime? Most people said, well, 51% said very well in daytime and 75% said very well at night. And then you can see how that goes. And the study asked, how likely are you to recommend loop to another person with type one diabetes? And 99% of people said somewhere between likely and very likely to recommend loop to another person with type one. This might explain why there have now been more than 10,000 different people ordering Riley links in more than 60 countries around the world. There are so many things incredible about DIY loop from the ability to say how long your carbs are gonna be absorbing for, what kind of carbs am I eating? To biometric authentication for, for your boluses from an iPhone to being able to do all of the things that you need to do for your diabetes from your watch. So all of that is happening. Loop has gone, uh, well, it's gone viral and people are using it all over the world. Meanwhile, back in the FDA, they start the pre-certification pilot program and they start pushing for interoperability. So this is the FDA saying, we understand the new world of software, or we're trying to. And Bakul Patel at the FDA says, when it comes to software, we think iteration is better for public health. Now imagine how important that is. And think about the old world where you used to get an insulin pump, and then you're kind of stuck with that pump for four years. That pump doesn't change. And now the FDA is saying iteration is better. These companies should be changing their devices. They should be iterating as they go. And the FDA selected nine companies to participate in the pre-certification pilot program for the FDA to learn about how to manage and regulate iterative software development. Those companies include Apple, Samsung, Johnson & Johnson, Fitbit, Verily, which is Google's health sciences company, Roche, and Tidepool. So there's a lot going on here. The FDA has got pre-certification, Tidepool's taking part of it, and the FDA in, in partnership with JDRF and the Helmsley Charitable Trust are pushing for interoperability. They're saying, choose an insulin pump that you want, choose a CGM that you want, choose the insulin that you want, you choose what's right for you. That's how the FDA wants it to work. And then they actually created regulatory pathways for each of those things. ICGM stands for Integrated CGM or Integrated Continuous Glucose Monitor, which means the CGM is literally designed to be part of other systems. ACE pump stands for Alternate Controller Enabled Pump, meaning here's an insulin pump that can be controlled by itself or is designed to be controlled by some alternate controller. And then finally, IAGC or Interoperable Automated Glycemic Controller. This is a new regulatory pathway for something that's a controller. It's not an insulin pump and it's not a CGM. It's just something that says, hey, maybe I'm running an algorithm, a closed loop algorithm, and I can do boluses and I can send commands to ACE pumps. So the FDA has created these pathways. 
So kudos to the people at the FDA, incredible innovation. Here's a famous quote from Wayne Gretzky credits his dad, Walter, with this, go to where the puck is going, not to where it's been. And at Tidepool, we spent a lot of time thinking about this. Everything seems to be pointing in this new direction. The FDA is pushing for uh, iterative software development. The FDA, Jaderif, and Helmsley Trust are all pushing for interoperability. The Jabe Center is running this study of hundreds and hundreds of people on DIY Loop. And DIY Loop is becoming incredibly popular. By the way, I'm using DIY Loop, and most of the Tidepool team was using DIY Loop. And all of the insulin pumps and CGMs were showing that they were moving to Bluetooth. So they could have real compatibility or connectivity between these devices and smartphones. So where's the pump, where's the puck going? That's where we wanted to be. And we Tidepool uh, are standing on the shoulders of the We Are Not Waiting movement. This is our little picture of little Tidepool on the shoulders of the We Are Not Waiting giant. So this is what we decided to do. We're gonna take the Loop app, we're gonna put it through Tidepool's quality management system with, for our software design, uh, QA, and iterative software development. We're gonna submit it to the FDA, and we're gonna use the data from the JABE observational study to show that the Loop algorithm is safe and effective. We shared this plan with the Helmsley Trust and the JDRF, and both of them said, that's amazing, we wanna support you. And then we started talking to industry and announced partnerships with Dexcom, Omnipod, and Medtronic, some of the uh, biggest forces in the diabetes device world. Caveat, Tide, this is, so here's a screenshot of what Tidepool Loop might look like. This is a, uh, a design concept. Tidepool Loop is not cleared for use in the US or outside of the US. This displayed conceptual rendering is a product in development. So uh, I do want to address what are some updates one might expect from DIY loop to Tidepool loop. And I'm going to, you know, I'm going to talk about these things at a very high level because we are actively in discussion with the FDA. So nothing is finalized, but at a high level, connectivity is different because I'm going to hold up my Riley link. This is probably the device that I love most in the world. This Riley link, it has changed my life maybe more than any other device. And it is also the device that I can't wait to get rid of more than any other device. I love it. I've talked to Pete about this. Pete, who created the Riley Link, feels the same way. Um, Tidepool Loop will connect directly to CGM and directly to insulin pumps. No intermediary, no Riley Link. It'll be a direct connection. So that's one change you can expect. Uh, design changes, pretty minimal. The design changes are there to improve the user experience where we can. One thing you'll see right off the bat as you look at this design concept is the colors are slightly different. That's to increase visible, uh, visual accessibility. Um, it, the, brighter, the colors are bolder, brighter, uh, easier to see. There will be a prescriber involved. So for Tidepool Loop, it starts with the doctor. The doctor will have to write a prescription for Tidepool Loop and help people get started. Remember, Tidepool Loop isn't about providing a new solution for the 10,000 of people on DIY Loop. Tidepool Loop is about taking what is so incredible about DIY Loop and making it safe and scalable for hundreds of thousands of people. Training. Training for Loop will be provided inside the app. It will be a structured in-app user training with extensive resources to answer all the questions that folks might have and customer support. Tidepool's customer support team will be available to provide HIPAA compliant support. Um, so these are just kind of, I think in a nutshell, what uh, we're hoping to bring to the Loop community through Tidepool Loop. Uh, I should have mentioned, it will also be available in the App Store so that we're not building code ourselves. Uh, this was a cool milestone that we celebrated recently, uh, K203689. That is the official K number at the FDA for Tidepool Loop submission. And this was this submission was accepted in December uh, of last year. 
Some key differences between DIY Loop and Tidepool Loop, while both are open source, DIY Loop is community supported and it is do it yourself. And oh my God, is this the most incredible community in the world. Tidepool Loop, also open source, it is under development, it is not yet available. DIY Loop requires a Riley link, works with older Medtronic pumps and Omnipods. Tidepool Loop will be supported by Tidepool, submitted to the FDA, available in the App Store, and compatible with Bluetooth low energy ACE pumps. DIY loop, in case anyone was confused, is not a Tidepool project. Okay, I am gonna end my slides right there. Um, and I'm gonna stop my screen share. And Joanne, let me know what is next. Is this uh, a good time that we might be able to open for questions? Absolutely. And we have a bunch of questions um, in the chat. Let me get that back up. But yes, absolutely. Let's, let me close that. Here's the chat. Okay. What, what I did was I threw in some of the questions I had already sent to you because those were the first questions that came in. So we'll start from the top there. Um, Will you please ask Brandon what target guardrails Loop submitted to the FDA for the app and if a target of blood sugar would, if a change of target of blood sugar would be possible? You knew this was coming, so. No, absolutely. Um, as someone who uses DIY Loop and will be using Tidepool Loop, uh, this is an important question, I think, for all of us. And the thing that I can say is that Tidepool's intention is to maintain user configurability. User configurability is one of the most powerful parts of the DIY loop experience. And the clinical data that we're providing to the FDA is the data from the observational study. And the observational study included that user configurability. Uh, it's something that we are actively discussing with the FDA, but I will tell you from Tidepool's perspective, uh, it is very important to maintain configurability. It, it, yeah, we agree with you a thousand percent. Um, we've been talking to other device manufacturers with uh, closed loop systems, and that doesn't seem to be something that they say FDA will let them do. And they're aiming at the middle of the country where, and they show that they don't have endocrinology support and um, they it's only safe to have a set target. So you see a way around that. The, um, yes. <laughs> the way that the process works is any company designs a product, collects clinical data to support the safety and efficacy of that product and submits that clinical data to the FDA. To my knowledge, there hasn't been any company that has designed configurability into their system yet. Tidepool was in a very interesting situation because we're using DIY loop as the system that generated the clinical data. And that system did have configurability built in. So uh, it is a different starting point for us than these other companies. And uh, we see the value in having configurability. So it's something that we are certainly putting front and center in the conversations with, uh, with the agency and they're engaged in the conversation with us. Generally, how these things go is when one device gets approved for some feature, it becomes a predicate that other devices can then point to. So that hasn't happened yet. And that makes it harder for all of the other devices to say that they're going to put it in because there's no predicate to point to. Tidepool is providing the data from the JABE observational study, and we'll see where it goes. So you're coming from a different point, starting point than they are. We are coming from a starting point of uh, including clinical study data in our submission where settings were configurable in that clinical study. You're making us happy. Um, question, will this be available in Canada or are you only focusing or in, elsewhere in the world or are you focusing primarily now in the US? Uh, yes and yes. So we are focusing right now on the US. So part of being a startup is staying focused and not taking on more than you can handle. And I'll tell you, we are learning a lot going through this process of working with regulators. We very much want to make Loop accessible through app stores to as many people in as many places as possible. And again, the Loop community has given us a huge head start, for instance, with translations. 
Loop already supports DIY loops, already supports translations in many, many, many languages, which gives us a massive head start to go to other countries. But we do need to respect privacy laws and regulatory laws in any country that we take Tide Pool Loop to. So we're going to do that in the responsible way, always following the laws of any, uh, any location. Okay, there, uh, I'll have a lot of questions for you towards the end, but I want to go more on the, the technical. Um, let's talk about Afreza. Do you know of any smart way or do you plan a smart way to somehow put that into the algorithm so you can say, yeah, I took a four unit cartridge? Um, two things come to mind. I think that the smart way would be to have an insulin model that reflected a Fresa. And in DIY loop today, there's four insulin models. Not There's not Tide Pool Loop, DIY loop. There's the Walsh model, rapid acting children, rapid acting adults, and FIASP. You could imagine a fifth model, which is a Fresa. And somehow you could create a bolus and indicate to use that model for that bolus. It's a little bit complicated because the way that the algorithm works today, the, the, whatever model is used for all insulin on board. So that might have to be differentiated. If we could figure that out, that I think would be the smart way. The workaround that I use, I'm gonna take my tide pool hat off and put my DIY loop hat on. I have an override called the Freza that says um, my target is 250 and I have like, super hyper insulin sensitivity. So basically this don't give me insulin for 30 minutes. So I take a puff of a Fresa, tap that on, and then loop knows don't give me insulin for 30 minutes. Um, that's how, that's like my DIY workaround. But I, again, I think the smart way to do it would be to actually build in that insulin model. Makes sense. Um, okay, here we go. Night Scout. Yeah, we, we've been talking and working with Ben and, and he is amazing. Um, do you ever see tide pool software being real time or integrating it, Night Scout? Uh, I absolutely see tide pool software being real time. Um, and I, I talked about that a little bit in the presentation, um, but we have done some of the work to enable that. We've got more work to do and we will be doing that. So yes, we do expect tide pool to become real time. Um, in terms of Night Scout integration, uh, I don't see a formal Night Scout integration in Tidepool, but folks do have access to their Tidepool data and can do whatever they want with that data. So um, I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. Gotcha. Um, so let's talk about support. Uh, you have some amazing, amazing documents and videos training people on how to use Tidepool. Um, but most of the endos I know don't know how to use it and I'm not in an unpopulated area, um, which means your work is cut out for you to, to educate the healthcare providers. Um, are you assuming that there will be some sort of support out of the endo offices for settings and data analysis? Um, or is there a virtual advisor that sits in the back that, someone can dump their data to and pay a fee and get some feedback? Great question. Um, so Tidepool recently, actually in response to COVID-19, launched a website called tidepool.org slash telemedicine that is um, specially designed for helping clinicians all over the country engage with their patients using Tidepool. Um, we saw a huge uptake in clinician adoption of Tidepool web uh, during COVID. And so now we have thousands of clinicians using Tidepool, um, and it's pretty incredible to just take part in, uh, in helping the community in that way. We will always be working on creating uh, new software and new uh, training modules to help clinicians. In terms of Tidepool Loop, I think one of the great things about it is, and this is the power of doing things from your smartphone, that all of the data can be synced in real time over the cloud to Tidepool Web. So anytime you need help, your data is already there and anyone who you've provided access to can go in and take a look with you. Will there become an 
ecosystem of providers who are plugged into Tidepool and Loop and have expertise and provide value-added services. That's a very cool idea, Joanne. Thank you very much. Um, but I, you know, from a technology and infrastructure perspective, it it will absolutely be there from day one that your data from Loop will be uh, accessible via Tidepool should you want to share it. Got it. We, we've been discussing this quite a bit and um, well, I'll speak for myself, but I would like to say most people echo this, that our medical doctors and, and furthermore, our CDs really don't know how to do this. They don't know how to do settings. I have a great endocrinologist. I show him my results and he goes, great. And that's the end of it. Doesn't want to know what I do. Doesn't know, want to know how I do it. And I consider him intelligent, but is not trained in this and not capable. So is there going to be another level of care providers who are not medical people, but computer scientists who do data analysis? Because the data coming out is constant. There's so much of it. And, and doing it once every three months doesn't work. Do you see that any kind of solution that will come through AI expert systems, non-medical people doing data analysis? Absolutely. You're reminding me of something I once heard from, uh, from my friend, Dr. Aaron Neinstein, who is a endocrinologist at UCSF. Mm -hmm. And he said, uh, 10 years ago, people would come into their doctors with their BG logbooks. And the doctor was expected to look at that and then help you. And so they'd have about 100 data points. Maybe if you were really good at maintaining your BG logbook, you'd have 100 data points. And over the last 10 years, we've gone in the worlds of CGM and insulin pumps, where now with every visit, if you're going in every three months, instead of having 100 data points, you have 100,000 data points. Mm -hmm. And you have the same expectation or maybe even more of an expectation that your clinician is going to review all that data and then help you with it. And it is the diabetes version of the data deluge. And I think you're completely right that the solution is going to be in AI. One thing that DIY loop doesn't do is uh, provide you with settings recommendations. Now there is, I think there's an open APS feature called auto tune that starts to try to do that, starts to try to tell you, maybe try this basal rate, try this. I think that more of that is in our future where again, the value of this data being um, on an app, connected to the cloud, the cloud can constantly be churning to your data, finding patterns. And it could be patterns like, hey, your insulin sensitivity factor, maybe you should change this way or this way. Or it could be in real time, hey, Joanne, I think that you ate 30 minutes ago and forgot to enter your bolus. Mm -hmm. So there's different kinds of AI that we can apply and Tidepool is looking at all of these things. Um, so absolutely, I completely agree that the burden on the clinicians, uh, need, it needs to actually be alleviated a bit by AI so they're more supportive. Yeah, I don't think they, can, they can't do it. It's just not humanly possible in the time they have, given they only have 24 hours a day. I, I don't think it's doable. Hopefully they should sleep too, so maybe they have a little <laughs> less than. <laughs> okay, uh, Kenny asks, how slow will Typo Loop be to adopt features currently in and added to DIY over time? Oh my God, that's an amazing question. So, um, so you heard me say this over and over again, there is tremendous value in having uh, a diabetes system being run from a smartphone. And one, an, another value proposition of the smartphone is you can release changes through the app store and you can do it with uh, incredible frequency. So, um, so we have that going for us, which is very different than, uh, than other systems. And by the way, with DIY loop, uh, as new features come out, you need to go back into Xcode and get the version. It's, there's actually a little bit of extra friction to getting the new feature in DIY loop. Um, and, and don't take that as, as any shade thrown on DIY loop as a user of it. It is, uh, I, I love it very much. Um, Tidepool does put all of the code that we add, all of the features that we add goes through our quality system. It goes through our design reviews. It goes through human factors testing. It goes through 
um, potentially clinical testing, depending on the potential safety ramifications. So all, we do, uh, we will follow all of those, um, all of those processes and procedures to make sure that what we do release is safe. But the infrastructure that we have set up uh, allows us to roll out new features uh, much faster than I think what you think of a traditional medical device. And that again is part of why we're in this FDA pre-certification pilot program so that we can work with the FDA on how a regulated medical device can continue to iterate in a fast and safe and effective way. That's great. These questions are fabulous. Um, Thank you. Do you anticipate um, settings changes from the DIY loop to the tide pool loop? Um, one change that we are contemplating is renaming the suspend threshold. And the reason for that is there are a lot of, not a lot, there are other devices that use terms like suspend threshold or threshold suspend. And the way that they use it is actually a little bit different than how Loop uses it. Um, but that's just a name change. It's not really a settings change. So uh, that that is the only settings change that I can think of off the top of my head. I will say the settings in Loop are, uh, the settings in Tide Pool Loop are, uh, nicely organized. Um, so that's something that I, I think might be a little, but it doesn't actually change the settings itself. Okay. Um, okay. I'm, I'm going to shift into a topic that I'll take out later. Um, Tide Pool Loop will be open source. However, it seems that, that it might be using pump and CGM uh, like Omni Dash that are closed source. Do you think there's a future for DIY solutions for those that want better control? Um, I certainly hope so. Uh, I have, as, as you've seen throughout this presentation, my life has been changed so much for the better by DIY solutions. Oh. And, um, and, and personally, and I can speak on behalf of Tidepool, uh, we believe as an organization that people are better off when they have access to their data and people who have access to their data can create DIY technologies to get the most out of their health data. So do I think there's a future? Absolutely. Okay, and a question came in between that. Um, will it connect to iPhones and or Apple Health or both? I think you answered that in your talk. Yes, um, we will. So the version that we have submitted to the FDA is for iOS, so it'll be on iPhone um, and it will communicate with Apple Health so data can be stored in Apple Health. Okay, here come the money questions. Um, can you please talk about pricing, insurance coverage, and has there been a cost forecast to this? What will it cost? Yeah, great question. Um, as a nonprofit organization, Tidepool prioritizes access above everything else and making sure that everyone who wants to use Tidepool Loop can use it is really critical for us. Uh, for the last seven years, we have been in a position to offer all of Tidepool software to end users free of charge. That gives you a sense of how we think about access. Um, yes, we do need to cover costs and we're thinking about ways to do that. But in terms of our motivation, making sure that everybody has access and making sure um, uh, that uh, making sure that everyone has access is absolutely critical. From an insurance perspective, there, there is no um, precedent for reimbursement of a third party closed loop controller. So that's gonna be kind of the next hurdle in this ecosystem is we've gotta figure out how do we get hundreds of insurers to be able to reimburse for use of a closed loop controller. It's not something that we have figured out yet, but it is something that we are thinking about. Okay, so because we see that with um, the Omnipod 5, you have to get um, a prescription for pods, you have to get a prescription for um, CGM, and then if it's using Tidepool Loop, then you have to somehow figure that in as well. So uh, the nature of an interoperable system is you get these different devices and you put them together. So you might get an iPhone and separately you get your AirPods. They, they don't come together. They are compatible with each other, but they don't come together. And that's how I think about um, getting an, 
an insulin pump, getting a CGM, and getting a controller in an interoperable system. You can choose the right components for you, and then you can blend them together. It is certainly incumbent upon the device makers to make sure that bringing them all together is as simple and seamless as possible. And we're putting a lot of thought and attention and care into that. Okay, let me come back to the money because I'm trying to review what you said. We don't have a sense of what it will cost and whether it will be reimbursable. Uh, it will. Um, we, uh, I'm, I'm stuck on reimbursable because there, there is no concept of reimbursement right now for, um, for closed loop systems. Mm -hmm. From a cost perspective, uh, the thing that, the, the message that I want to convey is that access is very important to Tidepool as a nonprofit. And so we will do what we need to do to make sure that folks who want access to it have access. So it could be something like a token or a license that you buy, like you buy an Apple developer's license. Uh, it will, well, that's getting into some kind of creative thinking around implementation. I think the, the way we think about activating Tide Pool Loop is actually just with a prescription code. So mm -hmm. you talk to your prescriber, your doctor, you say, hey, I want to start using Tide Pool Loop, and they can go in and send a prescription to your email. And then you just have a prescription code in your email, you download the Loop app, and you plug in your prescription code. And then boom, you've got the Loop app. And you can connect it to whatever compatible devices you might have. This is so Jetsons. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, from Kenny comes back on your comments about um, an insulin model. Um, he says, model specific is a lot of work, but it would be very helpful. Applying models to carbs would be even more useful than an insulin model per bolus. Yeah. Iterating on carb models is also something, and this gets back to what Joanne was talking about, about AI. Um, understanding with all of this data in the cloud, how can we come up with more effective carb models? And that's absolutely something that we can and plan to do. So completely agree. Uh, innovating around carb models could be great. It, what we see is it's one of the harder things to actually wrap your head around it, it, is really how does it work even in the loop app? How do, do the carb screens work? <laughs> and what do I need to do to work with them? Um, okay, I know that this is an interesting question. The, the more I ask you, the more questions there are. This is fascinating. We've not ever had this, this many questions. Um, is there a target age group for the use of tide pool loop? Um, we uh, would love it to be broadly available. This is something that we're actively talking to the FDA about. Okay, and I know the answer to this. Do you have an anticipated date for FDA approval? <laughs> Uh, if anyone can figure that out, please let me know. That's <laughs> right, I got it. Um, well, let me come down to, will Tidepool have an automatic bolus option available? This comes back to um, the nature of our submission being based on the observational study data. Uh, the automatic bolus branch was actually not there yet during the JABE observational study. And so that's what our submission is based on. This also comes back to the um, iterative nature of Tidepool software, that we can continue to improve the software quickly over time. So, um, uh, so that, I'm gonna leave it at that. Okay, uh, our overrides, um, are they gonna be the same in Tidepool loop as DIY? I was never crazy at how overrides were designed. Uh, <laughs> thank you for framing that question that way. So similar to the answer to the last question about automatic boluses, um, the overrides were also introduced a bit late in the observational study. Now the overrides are something that is currently um, in our design process and will be going through our own human factors evaluation. So you mentioned you're not crazy about the design. Let me tell you personally, I freaking love overrides. Um, they were created, I believe, by Michael Pangburn, uh, and I have met his parents on multiple occasions to say, your son has, like, changed diabetes therapy. Like, I just think the concept of pairing a glucose target with uh, insulin sensitivity and changing that for some period of time is unbelievable. 
Um, but it is a new concept in diabetes therapy, and we do want to make sure that we get that design right. So it's something that we will be working on. And again, back to the iterative nature of our software is, uh, is something that we'll, um, we'll be working on and then get it out to people as soon as it's safe and understandable. Okay. These questions are getting fascinating. Um, also from Glenn, we have been supplying Apple with $200 over per head now for a number of years. Can you get Apple to give back for all of the money we've sent them? Yeah, let me make a phone call. <laughs> Uh, I know I don't I don't have that kind of clout with Tim Cook <laughs> yeah it, it's it's the sense of it's not quite fair but it's what we have so um oh I, I do look forward to the day when you can use Tide Pool Loop out of the app store and stop giving Apple uh your software developer registration fee Okay, thank you. We feel the same way. Uh, from Henrik, any plans to add protein and fat to the CARB model or have multiple models available? Um, I know Kenny Fox has been keen on these things. We've managed to get our daughter's time and range to 95%, but it would never have worked without taking protein and those things into account. Um, this, so uh, this is not something that we are working on currently. Um, but, uh, we do have some data from the observational study about fat and protein units. Um, so I think it's something that we should have an ongoing conversation about and figure out how we can work it into the, uh, user experience. And if you have any thoughts on that, I welcome you to send me an email about it, Brandon at tidepool.org. Uh, we had, um, Robert Silvers come and talk about FPU, um, but I don't think that many people are using it. Some have experience and they can put it in chat if they want to mention it. Okay, again, Glenn, um, how dependent on the Omnipod 5 Apple release is DI, is uh, type of a loop? Uh, I'm not sure I know what the Omnipod 5 Apple release is. We've got the Omnipod 5 has to go through its approval process. So you can't go forward until they're approved. For me, by the FDA? Yes. Uh, Tidepool, um, so Tidepool's path is somewhat independent of other device makers because we are an interoperable automated glycemic controller uh, that will be, um, we, are, we are applying to be labeled with ACE pumps and ICGMs that conform to our requirements. So, you know, we've announced a partnership with Insulet for the Omnipod. We've announced a partnership with Medtronic for a future Medtronic device. Um, we've announced a partnership with Dexcom. In theory, as soon as we have a cleared integrated uh, insulin pump and a cleared integrated ICGM and Tidepool Loop has been cleared, we can launch. So okay. we do need a cleared pump and a cleared CGM, and we need to be cleared for Tidepool Loop as well. Okie dokie. Uh, which Omnipod will the system work with? Is it Dash or Eros or either? It is a future Omnipod. It's the, it's the new five only. I am only permitted to say it will be a future Omnipod. <laughs> Thank you. We hear you. Um, um, stop using Overwise. Um, Small request, please, from Henrik. Please add safety to add carbs in the same way as safety for doing a bolus touch ID or code. Does that make it sense to you? Um, I, I think that Henrik is requesting um, biometric authentication on carb entries. And I think that even DIY loop kind of has that now because now what happens in DIY loop is you plug in your carb entry and then it takes you to the bola screen, but it hasn't saved the carbs yet. They're just kind of hanging out there until you either hit um, save and don't deliver, like don't do insulin, just save the carbs or save and deliver. So I, th I think Henrik, what you're asking for is already there both in DIY loop. Uh, well, I'll just say in DIY loop. If there's something else that you're looking for, if you could send me some clarification, that'd be helpful. Okay. Ben is watching on Facebook. Um, so he did ask, um, would Apple reject Loop without FDA clearance? 
Uh, I, it's hard for me to speak on behalf of Apple, but I will tell you Tidepool will not try to put Tidepool loop in the app store without FDA clearance. Okay. So it has- Is that, is that Ben, like Ben West, Ben? Ben of your roommate, Ben, yes. Oh, Ben hugs. <laughs> okay. Uh, any talks with Abbott to integrate the Libre 3? Um, I can only talk about commercial partnerships that we have announced. Okay. Um, and let, let me take this now to a higher level. You are, you are one of us. You, you have type one diabetes, you live with all the frustrations and the regulations and all the issues. Um, two things, one is there is a large concern in our community about people using DIY loop being shut down. Uh, we hear what happened in France. We are hearing comments about what might be happening in the EU, um, that if you use a device for a DIY loop, you will be prevented from buying the device. And the concern then translates to, will we be shut out of using DIY? Do you see that, that as a possibility? Hmm. Um, anything is possible. Um, it will be, uh, putting my keyboard away, it will be a sad day. Um, whenever anyone with a chronic health condition is denied access to a technology, a therapy, a medication that they need, or that can improve um, their ability to manage that chronic condition. Mm -hmm. um, that limitation to access is, is a sad day. And I hope that that never happens to us. I hope that that never happens to anybody. Uh, DIY Loop in particular is so incredible. Uh, it has just made such a difference in my life. And it is, um, I, I mean, I'll be honest, I, I toss and turn at night at the idea of not having access to it anymore. And that thought absolutely motivates me day in and day out to make a commercial version of it to make sure that I still have it, that my loved ones living with type one have it, and that this community has a version that has more commercial safeguards. Um, I do hope, I, I see the innovation that happens in the DIY space and it is absolutely unreal. And think back to Overrides and Michael Pengburn. Would that have, would we have ever gotten Overrides if it weren't for the DIY community? And personally, I think that that's the most important thing that has happened to my diabetes management since closed loop systems. Um, so that's like a, a once in a five year, you know, innovation. This community uh, adds so much value to the lives of the people in it, um, being able to DIY. So I hope um, that that never happens. Um, I see, I hear that it has happened in other countries. Um, and I, I do think that anytime we take access away uh, to people's data, to people's devices, to people's therapies, that's a really sad day. Um, sorry, just got a message. We'll, we'll talk about that in a minute. But um, I agree with you. I think it would be horrific because we've worked so hard to be, have access to our data. Um, and Tidebull's done a great job in integrating it. And so has Night Scouts. Um, but we see what's coming through with Dexcom with rolling codes and only accessible. And some of us live with the awareness that this could go away tomorrow. We could be just shut out unless we're using older technology like we've done before. Um, maybe the question is, what can we as, as users of this technology do to be heard? Um, I have difficulty sometimes getting through to some of the the big money-making diabetes device makers um, that they're either were not viewed as very important or they really don't much like us. Maybe they're concerned about liability or whatever it is, but there's a sense that we could be just squished like a bug. Um, cut off our use of our data access, make it only by license that come from the device makers and it's not there. Is there anything the community can do proactively um, or in an advocacy position to say, be more transparent, work with us, talk to us. 
as opposed to talking to each other who are all making lots and lots of money? It, it, is there an approach? You know, I would, I would just be guessing here. Um, I think that getting organized could be critical, could be really helpful. Um, you know, one of the, this DIY community from one perspective is a whole bunch of N equals one experimentalists. Right. And yeah. one voice into an industry isn't very loud, but an organized community is. And, you know, if you, if you do the math in the back of the envelope about how much revenue these companies are getting from this community, mm -hmm. it's mind boggling. And um, Joanne, as a community leader like you are, uh -oh. to the extent that you can organize the community, collect names, get a petition, show these companies, this is how much revenue we're giving to you. And this is like, this is the conversation that we want to be a part of. Please let us be part of this conversation. I think that could be really powerful. That's what um, I would do as well. Yeah, it's... There's, I said, there's also folks at, at JDRF and the Helmsley Charitable Trust who, um, and, and beyond type one, who do represent the community also and have avenues into these companies. And so again, once the community gets organized, um, there also might be folks at those organizations that can help uh, take that organization and, and build your momentum that would or be introduce helpful. you to the right people. Thank you. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I know some people and when it comes to DIY, it's, it's a real uncomfortable conversation. And I don't, I think we certainly with Omnipod, we brought lots of customers and um, I, I had been saying that to them for years. We'll bring you more customers. And they said, we don't want you. We don't want you using devices that we don't know. So um, yeah, I would love to do something in an advocacy that would kind of, help move us forward in a safe way um, and keep the options open. Um, someone just said, Facebook group, Loop and Learn is growing like crazy and I feel like we are all in this together. Well, there you go. Um, two more things. One is uh, about Johnson & Johnson that you mentioned as a company that you're doing things with. Can you say anything about that? You no, know, I mentioned Johnson & Johnson as part of the FDA pre-certification pilot program. So they, uh, like Tidepool and Roche and Apple and Samsung and Fitbit, they were uh, invited to participate in the pre-certification pilot program. I'm not sure what their level of participation is right now. Um, back when the program started, they were, uh, they were one of the announced participants, but I, I, wouldn't, I didn't mean to frame it as Tidepool and Johnson & Johnson are collaborating directly on it, but just that we are co-participants in the program. Got it, okay, so then, one more comment, and you can kind of know this one from Ben, your roomie. Uh, show us the baby. <laughs> Did you just make a baby request? Yes. Let me see if I can get the baby. <laughs> Darling, is the baby available? <laughs> is it dinner time? <laughs> it's, it's dinner time. They said he's full of food. Can we bring him anyway? People want to say hi. <laughs> Give me 60 seconds. Is there anything else before I go to grab him and bring him down and get myself card covered in food? Any other questions? Um, uh, no, go do it. Uh, All right, I'll, I'll do it. I'll be right back. Uh, introduce him. All right, everybody. This is baby Nolan. Baby Nolan, can you say hi to everybody? Hi. I love his eyes. So beautiful. I see. Can you wave to Joanne? Put Joanne's video on here. <gasps> oh, hi, Joanne. Hey, happy hi. birthday. Oh, Are you having a happy oh, birthday? Look at the smile. Oh, my gosh. I'll babysit. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. I'll be calling you soon. <laughs> I'll do it. Um, okay, Kenny's asking one more question, so I'll, I will do that one. Well, little Nolan listens to it because he'll he'll just absorb all of this. Um, uh, did you see my question about control of DIY that Tidepool has? Kenny, why don't you un unmute and ask your question if you're still on? All right, I'll see how my internet's working. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, new computer. Um, so currently, Tidepool has an employee who manages 
who holds the keys to the DIY code. Is that something that maybe should be, shouldn't be? Sometimes it feels like the only changes that get committed are those being worked on by Tidepool, or um, that's all that particular individual has time to work on, which is true. But it also means that they can filter out anything that they think may negatively impact Tidepool's ability to move forward, um, while it can also feel like it's holding back the community from we're not waiting to we can't have it. So I don't know what are your thoughts around if that what that relationship should look like between the DIY community and Tidepool. Yeah, that's a it's a fascinating question and it's one that we have talked about a ton. So I'll tell you our policy at Tidepool is that um, we do not restrict what our employees do on their personal time. I think that the day we start doing that, oh, you want your spoon? The, the day we start restricting what our employees do uh, is a day that we can no longer hire incredible employees. Um, so that's kind of been the foundational policy at Tidepool. Um, I, <laughs> I am moving the keyboard away from the child. Here, have a, have a spoon. Um, um, so yeah, I, I guess, um, we, we're not going to restrict what folks can do. And that also means if somebody who is active in the DIY community wants to come work at Tidepool, I mean, God, there is no better recruit for us than somebody who is active because they're, they're one of us. They know this community, they know these products. So, you know, can you imagine if we get a job application from, you know, some, someone in this community who is perfect for a particular role at Tidepool and, and either we're in a position to say, no, we don't want you because you're in the community or say, um, uh, hey, we'll, we'll take you, but you have to stop contributing. Like we just couldn't do either of those things. So what that ultimately means is um, we do have people uh, who work at Tidepool and on their personal time, they, uh, they might do other things in the diabetes community. And that's great. Um, and I can't really imagine having a policy other than that. You know, hopefully that makes sense. It does. I guess it's just tricky that um, there isn't really anyone else that has the access to the code other than someone that is at Tidepool. So it and, yeah, and obviously every, anyone who works at Tidepool has free choice. It's a, it is an employment at will. So we don't force anyone to work at Tidepool. Um, but, uh, but we, we do love to try to get the, you know, um, to have the most talented people on the team. Okay, so one more question. Um, there was a, a, a study that was posted just last week. Several of us clicked on it and within moments it was full. Um, and I went back, I went to you and then um, and work, work with Christopher. Are there more studies coming up that we should be watching out for? Oh, what a good question. Um, we certainly will be doing more studies. Um, we do a bunch of human factors engineering studies, which is uh, to try out new designs that we're thinking about incorporating into Tidepool Loop um, or things that have come out of the DIY community that we want to incorporate into Tidepool Loop. So do keep your eye out for those. I will say in all of those studies, we, um, we have to take a, uh, we in very intentionally select a broad cross-section of people with diabetes, folks who have no CGM experience, folks who have no pump experience, folks who have no DIY loop experience, folks who do have DIY loop experience. So there's kind of quotas for each of these things to ensure that uh, the uh, feedback that we're getting is representative of the intended audience of a tight pool loop user. Um, so yeah, with, uh, with that said, do, do keep your eyes open and uh, Christopher, who I connected you with, and he, Christopher Snyder's our incredible, incredible community manager, yeah. um, is, uh, can, can help facilitate and keep anybody apprised. He's Christopher at tidepool.org. Yeah, he does all the, uh, the, the community outreach and, and he does a great job. And he also does a lot of the interviews on your videos. They're excellent. Thank um, you. There's also, I, I should plug, so tidepool.org slash loop is a place that, um, you can put your contact info. And if we do have any major updates, uh, we'll be sending it there first. So 
tidepool.org slash loop. I also want to plug, we are currently hiring a backend engineer. Um, so if anyone on this call uh, is a back engineer, is interested in, uh, in the role or has friends, please spread the word uh, that Tidepool is hiring a backend engineer. We are, um, uh, that's, a, that's the role that we're currently hiring for. So um, wanted, to, wanted to plug that again. Would someone who is a backend engineer know that what you're asking for? Absolutely. Okay. okay. Are you, Joanne, are you a backend engineer? No, but I know I'm not. <laughs> yes, know, yes, yes, I didn't yes. Know absolutely. Okay. Somebody, some, somebody who knows would know. Okay, that sounds great. Listen, thank you. We've been working on getting this pulled together. It's been excellent. There's been so much interest. This is probably the highest volume of people watching on an era of videos. People are watching you guys and very, very interesting. So thank you. Really, thank you for taking the time on Sunday. Thank your wife. And give your mom a hug for me. Will do. Joanne, thank you for hosting. And to the whole community, um, just thank you for everything that you do. Uh, you have changed my life in so many ways. So thank you. And can I just say, you all got to meet my one-year-old. And I, you know, thinking back seven years ago, six years ago, I, I was so intimidated at the idea of having a baby and having type 1 diabetes at the same time. And now with loop, it's like not something I have to think twice about. I just get to spend so much time thinking about him and so little time having to think about diabetes. So thank you all for all that you do. It is such an honor to be part of this community. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good evening. Have dinner with your baby. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Okay.